In this video, I'll be discussing the top five things that U3 does better than U4. This is actually the third video in a very short series that includes the top 14 things that U3 does better than U4, but I've retitled it for no other reason than to maximize clickbaiting. If you want to see points 6 through 14, I highly recommend you go watch my other two videos, and I'll link to those in the annotations. Now before we get to the list, a few things I want to go over. First off, this is my personal list and your views might vary. And even though I sometimes upload time lapses where I've taken over half the world in EU4, I personally think that blobbing is a very bad thing. Second, this comparison does not take mods into consideration because some mods have addressed these very issues. This is simply a comparison between EU3 Divine Wind and EU4 with all presently available DLCs, current version 1.19. Third, this list is sorted in order of importance, and although in the previous videos I was mostly talking about things that simply didn't make sense or were slightly inconvenient, in this video I'll be talking about things that, at least in my opinion, make the game worse than it should be. Fourth, this is not a list of things that make EU3 better than EU4, and this is not to say that EU3 is a better game than EU4. These are simply design choices that, at least in my opinion, prevent EU4 from being as good of a game as it should be. And also, while compiling the top 14 list, I came up with an equivalent number of things that EU4 does better than EU3. I might end up making that video at some point if people are interested, but personally I think most of those are pretty obvious, and it's less interesting than looking back at the older game and seeing what it does better specifically than the newer game. And finally, before we get to the top 5, I'm going to very quickly go through numbers 14 through 6, just in case you haven't seen those other two videos. Number 14. EU3's province population system is better than EU4's development system. Number 13, Scorched Earth was more useful and more meaningful in EU3. Number 12, missions are more important, have a greater impact, and are more likely to change the direction of your game in EU3. Number 11, EU3's uncertainty is better than EU4's certainty. And I'm not gonna spend 10 minutes explaining this again, but basically, EU3 uses percent chance and mean time to happen, whereas EU4 uses percent completion and progress. This also applies to things like AI behavior and diplomatic actions. If you're not quite sure what I mean and you want to see the full discussion, you can watch it in part 1. Number 10. Culture conversions made a lot more sense in EU3. Number 9. Westernization is better in EU3 than in the current version of EU4, mostly because it's non-existent right now in EU4. Number 8. Religious conversions were better in EU3. Number 7. Diplo annexations made more sense in EU3. Number 6. EU3's budget sliders are better than EU4's monarch points. This applies to technology, income, war exhaustion, stability, any number of things that points get invested into versus the way you use your treasury in EU3. Now that we've recapped the previous points, let's continue with the top 5. Number 5. CBs were handled better in EU3 than in EU4. Now this is one of the major contributing factors to blobbing in the early game. In EU4, you can look at any nation around you and regardless of what they think of you, what you think of them, or any realistic reason for you to want to take their land, you can start building a spy network, and usually within two years you're going to have a strong enough spy network to fabricate a claim on that nation. So basically, just like that, you can get free claims on any nation around you. Of course, you can get multiple claims on a single nation if you want to save your diplomatic points, but the fact is, you can get a CB to go to war with anyone around you. Depending on whether you're a duchy, a kingdom, or an empire, you can send two, three, four, or even more diplomats if you have certain conditions met. You can send these diplomats off and justify all over the place. You can justify multiple claims on a single nation next to you. For example, I could justify four claims on Lithuania here. I could fabricate claims on all five of these provinces, and war score permitting, I could in theory take all five of them in a single war and not pay a single diplomatic point. And this is all okay. In fact, it's encouraged by this game. Basically, if you neighbor anyone, your optimum strategy is to drop as many claims on everyone around you as possible. Regardless of whether you act on the claims or not, at least the option is there. And of course, when you isolate smaller nations, that means they're not going to be around for very long. This sort of blobbing is much slower than what happens later in EU4, but it facilitates the process. Let's contrast that with EU3. In EU3, CBs are much harder to come by, and depending on who you start as, you might not have any CBs at all. In this particular campaign, I started with only a single CB, and that's only because I had a mission to vassalize Pomerania. If it weren't for this mission, I wouldn't have any CBs at all. 
Let's take a look at the Ottoman Empire. The Ottomans start with the reconquest CB on several nations in the area that have Ottoman cores. They also start with a conquest CB on Byzantium. Now the conquest CB is thanks to the mission, City of the World's Desire. And if they happen to take Thrace, then they'll gain a core on it thanks to the mission. They'll also lose some infamy and gain a bunch of prestige. This is another example where the missions in the U3 drive nations on whatever path they're going to take throughout the game. The Ottomans also have a couple of other CBs available. They can holy war against all infidels. They also have the tribal conquest CB on the various nomads that are bordering. So the Ottomans have a means by which they can expand into various tribes, and they have a means by which they can attack infidels. But they don't at present have a means to randomly attack any nation that borders them. This applies to virtually anyone. Austria, for example, at the start of the game has no CBs. Switzerland at the start of the game has no CBs. Burgundy has reconquest CBs and also a conquest, presumably because of a mission they have. So does all this mean that CBs are impossible to get in EU3? No, not at all. It just means that the CBs you get depend on what actually happens during the game. And these are things like missions, border friction, which national ideas you have, which government you are, your religion, your neighbor's religion, and other specific circumstances. But the fact is you can't just randomly decide to go to war with someone without paying for it. And you pay for it by losing stability and gaining infamy. Depending on your play style and what your goals are, no CB wars can be a very common thing in EU3. In EU4, no CB wars are incredibly rare. There's virtually no reason to ever use them. As I mentioned previously, your stability is constantly ticking up whether you're investing into it or not. So losing to stability when you're already at the maximum is not necessarily a bad thing. Your infamy is also ticking down constantly. So if you're at zero infamy, taking two infamy to declare no CB war is not necessarily a bad thing. Of course you won't be going into the war with the benefits of having a CB, especially the lower infamy and potentially lower war score costs, but the no CB war is a viable part of the game. In EU4, you virtually never have a reason to declare no CB war. The exception is if you're trying to meme it up, but for the average player this almost never happens. And that's the difference. In EU4 you can go to war with virtually anyone for any reason at any time. In EU3 you need a valid reason to go to war with someone, and if you don't have a valid reason, you're going to pay for it. And that makes sense. Number 4. Cores and coring were better in EU3. Now, of course, the optimum strategy in EU3 is to acquire cores through missions, but that's not always a possibility. When it's not a possibility, you acquire land and then have to wait for the core to develop. As demonstrated by these two newly acquired provinces, these provinces won't become core for the Ottoman Empire for a full 50 years. Two generations of people will have come and gone before this province becomes the core of the Ottoman Empire. Most of the people alive in the Ottoman Empire, when this becomes a core, will never have remembered a time in their lives when this province did not belong to the Ottoman Empire. In EU4, coring a province requires dumping X number of MacGuffin points and waiting 36 months. Three years? Three years? Is this some kind of joke? Do I really need to explain this? How the hell is this province going to become a legitimate part of the Ottoman Empire after three years? Well, that's not even the worst problem. Let's look at Montenegro. Venice has a core on it, and as we can see, this core is going to last at least 50 years. So you're telling me that the Ottomans can core this in three years, the next day they can lose it back to Wallachia, and for the next 50 years they're going to have core on it as if this were a legitimate part of the empire. What the hell were they smoking when they came up with this? Okay, so we've already established that makes no sense at all, but how does this affect the game in a negative way? It means it's trivially easy to get rid of your overextension. You can take huge swaths of land, you can be way over 100% overextended, but you only have to deal with it for three years. Three years later, it's all integrated, and aside from a little bit of separatism, the rest of your empire doesn't suffer at all. This is one of the major contributing factors to blobbing, just the fact that you can get rid of your overextension so ridiculously fast. It also makes it trivially easy to cycle your corings. So for example, in a 15 year period, it's possible to take 500% worth of overextension in provinces and not go over 100% overextension. What? How does this make any sense? In EU3, you had to meter your expansion because it was going to take time to core things. In EU4, none of this makes sense. Number three, client states are bad, and EU4 is worse off for simply having them in the game. In the previous point I talked about how ridiculously easy it is to blob, and that's if you're the one doing the blobbing. 
Now if we have to take vassals into consideration, that problem increases exponentially. That is, you can take way over 100% overextension worth of land in a peace deal, and then you can partition it out between your various vassals. Thankfully, via the vassal interaction window, a vassal will not accept a province if it's going to cause it to become overextended. But there's a little bit of an oversight because that doesn't apply to client states. For client states, we have this handy little button right on the province view. And if your client state is already 100% overextended, it doesn't even matter because you can click this button and feed it as many additional provinces as you like. You can make your client states go way over 100% overextension. And as long as you don't mind killing rebels in their territory every now and then, there's no limit to how much land you can feed them. It's absurd! As vassals increase in size, their liberty desire is also going to increase. They have a minus 50% modifier, so not only can you take several hundred percent worth of overextension in a single war, you can feed it all to a single client state, make it core all of the land using its own administrative points, and it still won't have high enough liberty desire to break free. The AI doesn't even use client states, so the mechanic's not even remotely fair. In a multiplayer game with reasonably smart players, God have mercy on your soul if you lose a war in the late game, because half your country is going to be fed to one of these little bastards, and there's nothing you can do about it. Number 2. Administrative efficiency in EU4 ruins the late game. Now it's true that administrative efficiency did exist in EU3, but this was in name only. It did something completely different. It's not at all equivalent. It's apples and oranges, so I'm just going to ignore it. However, administrative efficiency is the number two thing that EU3 did better than EU4 because EU3 did not do it this way. At Administrative Tech 17, administrative efficiency increases to 20%. This increases to 40% at level 23 and 60% at level 27. This allows you to core things cheaper, it allows you to take more provinces in peace deals, it allows you to diplo annex using fewer diplo points, and it also reduces the effect of provinces on overextension. Basically, it serves no purpose other than to facilitate blobbing. Now, depending on how much experience you have at the game, and especially if you're newer, you just don't play that much, you know, it's a lot of fun once or twice, you get your favorite country and you paint your name across the map, and it looks nice, and hey, you won the game, right? You came in first, and it's huge, and it looks great. But, you know, if you put way too many hours into this game, as I have, then you'll probably feel the exact opposite. In fact, the late game is the least interesting part of EU4. The most interesting stuff happens before 1600, and virtually nothing interesting happens after 1700, because that's when the blob fest begins. And the blob fest happens in large part because of administrative efficiency. The later you get in the game, sure, the larger the chunks of land you can take and the cheaper you can take it, but the more boring it becomes, which is like the worst thing for a game. How is that a good thing? Now, I've already talked previously about all these various things that facilitate blobbing. And if you're like me and you think that blobbing is a bad thing, then this is perhaps the worst feature in the game. Personally, I hate playing games past 1700. I hate it. I absolutely hate the late game. And it's because of these systems, how they interact with each other, and it's how the whole game becomes about blobbing. And I don't like blobbing, but I do it anyway because that's what the game's about. The only reason I play past 1700 is if I haven't gotten an achievement, or if I'm trying to get a time lapse. And honestly, making the time lapses is the biggest hassle of all. It's like pulling teeth, because I have to play to the late game, and I hate the late game. And it's strictly because of the blobbing. And the thing that makes the blobbing worst of all is this feature that's designed to help you blob. And finally, the number one thing that EU3 does better than EU4, EU3's infamy is better than EU4's aggressive expansion. In principle, aggressive expansion should be the better system. It actually makes a lot of sense that the nations that are more closely related to a nation you just took land from should be more upset about it. That part is great. I have no issue with that. Everything else about the implementation is god-awful. And instead of having a great system, what we have instead is a convergence. It's the pinnacle of EU4 min-maxing. It's exemplary of EU4's certainty versus EU3's uncertainty. And although it doesn't make blobbing easy, the aggressive expansion system is what makes blobbing safe. And this is really the worst thing of all. Blobbing should never be safe. If you're going to take huge chunks of land, there should be some risk involved. And this system completely removes the risk. In EU3, your infamy cap is determined by a number of things, including the diplomatic skill of your ruler. The diplomatic skill of your ruler also determines the rate of infamy decrease per month. Because of this, you learn really quickly that it's very dangerous to get right to your infamy cap. 
If your amazing leader suddenly died, you might find that the diplomatic skill of your former leader's replacement suddenly puts you over the infamy limit. What's worse, the lower diplomatic skill now causes the infamy to drop even slower, so it's going to take longer to get below the limit than it would have otherwise. Thus, a smart player had to weigh the benefits of taking that extra land versus the risk of being closer to the infamy cap. And also because infamy was tied to CBs and provinces, and not to the development of provinces, it meant that annexing one province miners was usually a very bad thing. Let's make a quick comparison with Victoria too. It's almost never worth the 22 infamy to annex the one province miners. Montenegro, for example, has no population. It has no resources. There's no reason to spend 22 infamy on it. Simply not worth the effort when you could be doing other more useful things. That's the reason these small nations continue to exist throughout the entire game span of Victoria 2. In mods that greatly reduce the infamy needed to take these minor nations, these are usually the first nations that are annexed. The same thing applies to EU 3 and 4. In EU3, you have to ask yourself, is it really worth spending 8 infamy to annex a single province, assuming you don't have a CB? Most players would say no, but in some cases it's actually worth it. This is the sort of cost-benefit risk analysis that makes EU3 interesting. Contrast this with EU4, Montenegro is a worthless province and it doesn't stand a chance. There's literally no reason to let it exist. The same applies to any one province miner. But even if we ignore that, just the fact that the infamy cap can change in EU3, and the fact that the rate of reduction can also change, means that we have to be a lot more careful in our expansions. In EU4, that's completely gone. In EU4, when you offer a peace deal, you can see not only how much aggressive expansion you're going to get with anyone who might join a coalition, but you can also see who's going to join a coalition. And if you're aware of the mechanism by which coalitions form, this means you can completely avoid coalitions altogether. Or at worst, only have coalitions occur when you want them to occur. Also, because infamy is no longer a universal thing, it limits who can actually join in a coalition war. In EU3, being over infamy was a huge problem because you risk being attacked by virtually everyone, and you could be in multiple punitive wars at the same time. In EU4, this is not the case because you control who can join a coalition against you, thereby removing all of the potential risk. This becomes even more apparent in multiplayer games because, with the exception of the HRE, coalitions just don't matter. In the early and mid-game, players will try and stake their claims and carve out territory within their regions. And if the nations within a region decide to form a coalition against a player, it doesn't matter because by that point it's too late. The player's already too powerful for the coalition to have any effect. As Flurry Worry put it, the optimum strategy is to conquer areas in succession. That is, if you have high aggressive expansion with an area, you just keep pounding that area until it's completely obliterated. Then you move on to the next one. Coalitions might slightly slow the rate at which you take over an area, but they're not going to change the fact that you're going to take over the area. It would be really useful if other nations could join in on these coalitions once they form. I mean, this nation is clearly a threat. Why shouldn't other nations be able to join, even if the number's under 50? Who cares about this arbitrary number? Once coalitions formed, any nation in the world with negative relations with you should be able to join it. This is essentially what you had in EU3. If you went over infamy, you risked being pounded into the ground. And even if you didn't, it was tense and it was interesting. In EU3, if you went over infamy, there was an actual risk to your nation. It's possible you might have had several wars declared on you. It's possible no one declared war on you. The possibility was there, and how you dealt with the situation was what made it interesting. In EU4, there's nothing interesting about it. It's mindless, min-maxing at its worst. It's what makes blobbing easy, as I already mentioned, and that's why it's the number one thing that EU3 does better than EU4. So that wraps up the list. Let me know if you agree or disagree, and especially what you think is the number one thing that EU3 does better than EU4. Again, this is not a list intended to say that EU3 is a better game than EU4. In fact, I think the two games are very different in style, but I think EU4 would be a better game if it didn't throw out the lessons that were learned in previous entries in the series. As a metaphor, if EU3 were a combat flight simulator, in my opinion, EU4 would be the arcade version of that same game. Also, as mentioned, I do have an equivalent list of things that EU4 did better than 3, let me know if you want to see that at some point, although that is a little bit low priority right now. I am planning to record part 4 of my From Zero to Hero series for Victoria 2, so if you want to learn how to get better at Victoria 2, you might want to look for that here in a few days. This video has taken many hours to record and edit, so let's reach for the stars. If we could shoot for 2 likes on this video, that would be amazing. Thanks for watching, and have a good one.